In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for another wonderful and beautiful day you have given each one of us. Lord, as we have begun this journey in, pre in preparation for Christmas and beyond, as we are reflecting each day through the gospel passages about preparing for your second coming, and every day, Lord, excited to hear your voice, excited to hear your instructions, truly excited, Lord, to know that when you come again, you will find us ready in order to welcome you, to receive you, Lord, so that we in turn can hear that voice of yours telling us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enjoy in your master's joy. Enjoy in your master's happiness for all eternity. Today, once again, Lord, as we reflect on the day's gospel from Luke chapter 21, verses 33, 34 to 36, Help us, Lord, to understand the word. Help us to realize, Lord, all that you are telling us so that, Lord, every instruction that we are receiving, we can put it into practice in our day-to-day -day life and live the victorious life that you have promised us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So a warm welcome to you, my sisters and brothers. We continue today on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. And for the last four days, we have been doing precisely that. We are still on Luke, chapter 21. And many of you, uh, having gone through this Luke, chapter 21, would have realized that Jesus, for just one particular observation of his disciples and the crowds that were there regarding the temple, Jesus not only told them about the destruction of the temple, but he also told them much more and all that was going to take place, especially to Jerusalem in the short term and to the whole world before he would return again. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus has been speaking in Luke 21, Jesus has still not gone to the cross. He has not you know, obtain salvation for the whole human race. And yet, Jesus is prophesying in Luke 21, all that would happen to Jerusalem and to the temple which already took place, and what would happen during the end times. And here, brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of Luke 21, especially in today's gospel from verses 34 to 36, he is talking to you and me, he is not only talking to his disciples, which who were there 2,000 years ago, but he's talking to each one of us. And we shall see today what he is instructing us, how he is asking us to be alert, how he is asking us not to be, you know, uh, sleeping or to be in slumber, but to be alert because when we are alert, surely we shall know the signs when he is going to return again. So without any further delay, let us quickly read Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, let's go straight away to verse number 34. And Jesus says, Be on, your, be on guard, be on guard, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And the day does not catch you unexpectedly. You know, my brothers and sisters, if you have to be on guard as a warning from Jesus in this verse, then the day of the Lord will not come on you and me unexpectedly. 
Let me say this one more time. If we, all of us, are on the guard, because Jesus has been warning us in the scripture, verse number 34, then the day of Jesus Christ, when he comes again, will not come upon us unexpectedly. We shall be prepared. You know, my brothers and sisters, first we have to be on guard. What is the meaning of guard? If you ever go to a society or if you ever have, uh, you know, any, any particular township, there is always the police, always guarding. There is the milit there is the army of a country that is always guarding the borders of that country. If you have a society, then you will always have a watchman who is actually at the, at the gate, who actually only allows the residents to come in. And if anyone is coming in, surely he's going to stop them. He's going to inquire whom they are going to see. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, what are we being guard about? What is this? What is Jesus saying? Be on guard. What is this being on guard? You know, my brothers and sisters, the phrase be on guard was translated from the Greek word prochesko. It is, it is, it is actually a, a Greek word prochesko and it means to hold the mind, to hold the mind towards or pay attention or to be cautious about or apply oneself to or in other, in other words, adhere to. So there are all these terms that are mentioned about guarding oneself. You know, brothers and sisters, this attitude which Jesus is talking about is the very attitude which is opposite to what is described in the very next verse. Because in verse number 35, it tells you exactly, in this verse number th uh, 34, it tells you about dissipation and drunkenness and all about the worries of life. Please understand, my brothers and sisters. One who has to be on guard is a person who's guarding themselves over all the distractions of this life. Please understand, we are living on this earth and there are so many things in this world that are going to take our attention. For example, right now you are in this Bible class. Many of you in during this right now, because nobody is going to be watching you, your, your cameras are off and you just got your Bible with you. There is a possibility of your phone ringing. There is a possibility of someone in your loved one, in your family calling to you. There is probably a, a, a phone call that will come to you. Maybe there are things in your house that you have to do urgently. And when you come to a Bible class like this, a lot of things are going to come as a, as a temptation, as a disturbance for you so that you cannot be 100% in this class. And you know, my brothers and sisters, what are we called to guard ourselves from? We are called to guard ourselves. We are called to apply ourselves. We are called to avoid any distraction so that what we are going to hear regarding God's word, the instruction that God wants to give us, we will never be distracted. We will never be able to do anything else and we will stay focused. We will understand what is being taught so that at the end of this class, Whatever we have taken in, we shall be in a position to apply it and live the victorious life. Notice my brothers and sisters, one also, listen to this, one also personally has to be on guard for oneself. Each one has to be guard for himself. It, it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. It doesn't matter what the whole world isn't seeking, whether the whole world is not seeking the Lord. If we do not pay attention, my brothers and sisters, ourselves, we will be deceived. One of the greatest weapons of the devil is deception. And in these three verses today, Jesus is addressing the greatest weapon that the enemy has got, the greatest trick the enemy has got. And this enemy whom Jesus stripped and destroyed on the cross, he, he, he made him absolutely without any power on the cross. This very shameless enemy, Satan, also still comes keep troubling the people of God because he has become a master of deception. And therefore, Jesus is saying, when you are able to watch yourself, when you are able to guard yourself, when you are able to not get disturbed what your neighbor is doing, what your husband is doing, what your wife is doing, what your children are doing, what the world is doing, what is happening around, but you are so focused on what the Lord is instructing you and you are ready to do that. Brothers and sisters, when you begin to pay attention, all of us begin to pay attention ourselves, we will never be deceived. Please understand, when we are going to be distracted and the word is going to be preached, brothers and sisters, there is a possibility of us getting deceived 
not understanding the word and in our mind we are thinking we came to the Bible class, we went to that retreat but we never got the understanding of what God wanted to tell us and as a result we got deceived, we never got anything spiritually and at the same time even though we came for all these activities we were deceived and we never lived in a victorious life. You know my brothers and sisters, in this particular first verse, verse number 33, it talks about being weighed down. Do not be weighed down. That's what Jesus says in verse number 34. You know the Greek word which is used weighed down was translated simply to be burdened. And Jesus said to us in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, he says, let your, do not be troubled and burdened, but come to me all you are tired and overburdened. So Jesus is saying to you and me, if you are having any burdens, if you are having any trials, whether you are having any difficulties, remember my brothers and sisters, the situation is not on the outside. The situation is on the inside because this mind is under tremendous pressure. And when will the pressure come? When our mind is burdened. When we are burdened brothers and sisters, when we are weary, when we are carrying heavy burdens, what is going to happen? We are going to be burdened down by the cares of life and all that is going to happen is the word of God is going to get choked. Please remember, when we are burdened with the worries and cares of life, the word of God that we are listening to, instead of it germinating on the soil of our hearts, it is going to get choked. Remember, uh, about a week ago, about 10 days ago, we studied the parable of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter 4. And many of you who, who were there for this class would remember that in the parable of the sower and the seed, somewhere I think it is in Mark chapter 4 verse number 19, the, the seed, verse number 19, the seed fell upon the thorns and thistles. In verse number 19, the word fell, uh, the, 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 the seed fell on thorns and thistles. And what happened? The thorns and thistles turned into a snare for those who got carried away with the love of riches and the attractions of the world. You know my brothers and sisters, I want to take you just for a little while to Mark chapter 4 verse 19 to understand when the word of God falls on thorns and thistles. We get so much of distraction. We are, we are burdened with so many cares of this life. We are worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Some of us right now, whether we are, you know, it's about 4.30 here, we are wondering probably what, what we can have for dinner. Some of us who are in the early morning, we must be thinking what we should cook for lunch. Maybe some of us are thinking what groceries I need to do. Some of us are thinking about our children. Some of us are thinking about the future. There are so many things that are right now bothering us. And you know my brothers and sisters, when we take these burdens and the cares of this world, the word of God that is preached, the word of God that God wants to speak to us, it gets choked and it does not bear any fruit. It yields nothing. Let us read Mark chapter 4 verse number 19. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And it yields nothing. You know, my brothers and sisters, in this very verse number 34, the word drunkenness is used. Again, the word drunkenness is used. You will see that in verse number 34. Can we read verse number 34 again? Verse number 34. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day catch you unexpectedly. That day should not catch us unexpectedly. Remember my brothers and sisters, the word drunkenness is referring to a headache when somebody takes alcohol. You know, if anyone drinks a lot of alcohol, which for those of you who, are, who have ever gone through an experience of drinking a lot of alcohol, you would have realized that somebody who has drunk a lot of alcohol will get what is called as a hangover. And the hangover is nothing but a headache that is caused because of the after effects of drinking. Those brothers and sisters who are having a party, who are in a party mode all the time, will miss the signs of Jesus' second return. Please understand this, my brothers and sisters. The word of God is saying, do not be drunk. 
Do not be drunk. And here drunkenness is only referring to the people who are always having parties and celebrations, always drinking alcohol, having a great uh, and gala time. And as a result, because they are in a party mode all the time, they will miss the signs that God is presenting to the whole world and to you and me of his second return. Basically, brothers and sisters, this verse is simply saying that the signs of Jesus coming will be there, but we have to be alert and watchful to recognize them. Please understand, my brothers and sisters, if you and I are not alert, if you and I are not watchful, if you and I are constantly in party mode, we are all the time being distracted, even though we are doing good things, even though we are coming to a Bible study, even though we are going to retreat, even though we are going to church, even though we are doing a lot of spiritual activity. But if we are in a drunken state where we are getting distracted all the time, there are so many things that are coming to, to take us away and distract us from the understanding of God's word, then surely, my brothers and sisters, we will miss the signs of Jesus coming and we will never be able to be alert to what he's telling us in his word. And as a result, we will not be able to bear any good fruit of the kingdom of God. Verse number 35. Like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Look at this again. This is exactly the reason he's saying, Jesus saying, do not be deceived. He's talking about a trap, brothers and sisters. He's saying all these things where people will not be alert, people will be in party mode, people will be distracted, people will go about their life doing their own things. What is going to happen? This is going to be like a trap for them. For this trap will come upon all who live on the face of the earth. But praise God, brothers and sisters, when we are connected to the Lord, when we are having a relationship with Jesus, we are studying his word, we are alert to his word, we are alert to the signs that the Lord is giving us through his word. What is going to happen? We will never be falling into a trap. So what is a trap? What is a snare? A snare is nothing but a trap, brothers and sisters. Many a times, I don't know whether you have ever, 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 ever done that, but if you want to catch a bird or you want to catch a rat, there is always a snare. So traps have to be hidden and sprung quickly in order to catch their prey. Because if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the spring does not, does not come quickly, the, the, the prey will run away. So this is saying that the day of the Lord will be hidden for those who aren't watching, those who are not being alert, those who are being distracted, it will, it will come like a trap and it will happen so quickly so that they will not even have any time to even escape. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand, Jesus is giving us simple examples of day to day, how a person catches a rat, how somebody catches a bird or anybody, you know, uses a trap in order to catch its prey very quickly. And a snare if you understand a snare in a technical sense, a snare is a device for hunting. Because if you want to hunt somebody, you want to hunt a bird, you want to hunt a deer, you want to hunt, you know, the rats that are troubling in your house or, you know, you want to catch some birds, whatever you want to do, even for that matter, for the fish, you know, uh, the, the bait is used. All that is used for hunting or for fishing, you know, it uses a bait to, 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 to attract the victim to fall into the trap. You know, it is a fatal att attraction of the bait that seduces the prey and makes the prey come to the bait and that's the time the trap will work and the, and, and, and the prey will be caught. The bait, my brothers and sisters, is usually something that is good and even healthy, but its association with the snare is what is wrong and many fall into the trap and are destroyed. Please understand, my brothers and sisters, the bait by itself is not bad. The bait by itself is good. In fact, sometimes, you know, whatever has been put for the bait, for example, for the fish, there are some things which are put very good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not poisonous. Because if you're going to put something which is poisonous for the bait, like you want to catch fish and you put something which is bad, surely the fish is going to eat that and the fish is going to die. You're going to eat a poisonous fish. So the bait isn't good, but when it is put in association with a trap, that's the time the whole thing becomes absolutely deadly and it brings about a destruction. In the same way, brothers and sisters, let us look at some of the critical and very important scriptures where Satan uses the tool of deception. He uses the, the tool of ensnaring his, 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 his targets. 
and who are the people is going to ensnare? We may, we as human beings are going to go and catch fish in the in the sea. We are probably going to get birds in the in the air, or probably you know uh, that rat which is going to trouble us. But the devil wants to use you and me, and use that deception, use a snare in order to trap us and to destroy us. I want to take you to some scriptures to show you about the snare of the enemy. Psalm 106. Verse number 36. Let us read that. Psalm 106, verse number 36. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. You know, my brothers and sisters, in the Old Testament, the Heavenly Father, the Lord, deliberately instructed the Jews to make no alliances with the inhabitants of the land. He told them, I do not want you to associate with pagan nations. I do not want you to mix around with people who are Samaritan. I don't want you to mix around with people who don't belong to the, to the, to the chosen race, which I have chosen you and made a covenant with you. You know, my brothers and sisters, today, why, what, 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 is the, what is the implication of this statement? This is exactly like following the customs and traditions which have been passed to us through by our ancestors, which take us away from the word of God. You know, my brother says that Jesus said that in his word. He said, your, he's telling the Pharisees, your, your customs, your traditions and all the things that you are doing, they have become, they have made the word of God of no effect in your life. And the same thing can happen to us even today. Many of us, because of the of our background, because of our parents who did not know the word of God, they came from different areas of the world, they came from different regions of the world. They grew up in a particular environment, they have got a particular way of operating, they got certain traditions. And now that you know the word of God, if you continue to operate according to the old ways, the old traditions, you will find that the devil is going to use those things as a snare to stop you from bearing fruit with the word of God. How beautiful it is, my brothers and sisters. God in his wisdom is giving us a, a, a direction. He's giving us a warning that we should never get ensnared by the, by the things, what the, what, what the devil wants to use to take us away from the word of God. Let's take another, another verse from Psalm 124, verse number 7. Psalm 124, verse number 7. Let us read that. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Now look at this, what the, what the, what the psalmist says. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Isn't that a good, good, good sign, brothers and sisters? If you think... That if you are going to catch a rabbit or you're going to catch a rat or you're going to catch a fish, this is not a good news because you want to destroy those rats. You want to catch that bird. You want to, you want to catch fish. But when it comes to the devil, you don't want to be ensnared by the devil. A snare, brothers and sisters, is made to trap and to enslave. That is the reason why a, a, a snare is. A snare is nothing but it is a trap to catch the, 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 the prey and to make that prey that its slave. And Satan is our enemy, is going about seeking those whom he can devour. And that is exactly why Jesus came and we have now escaped the snake. That's exactly what, what the word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Can we read that? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, Jesus is talking about Satan, who is our enemy. He is one who is going about like a roaring lion, waiting for somebody to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Okay. You know, my brothers and sisters, when you begin to understand, please have a look at that scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8 is actually telling us about what the devil does. Let's read that. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around. Looking for someone to devour. That's exactly the job of the devil. My brothers and sisters, the devil is like a roaring lion. He's waiting to devour somebody. What is the meaning of a roaring lion? Why does the lion roar? A lion roars because he's hungry. He's looking for a prey. And in the same way, 
The devil is like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. He puts the fear into us. He allows the situations around. He brings the, you know, all these things that are happening, the storms, the pandemics and all these things that are coming against us. These things are what the roaring lion does. God is not the author of all those things. And through those things, he brings in fear. He brings in all the negative things that are in our lives. And as a result, my brothers and sisters, we fall prey to this to this devil who has already been destroyed by Jesus on the cross. He, Jesus has broken that snare. He has destroyed that snare so that we have now been able to escape. We are no more in the clutches of the devil and now we have been completely saved. Let, let, I don't want to go for other verses, but I want you to refer to some of the verses and, and do that as a homework. For example, Exodus chapter 23 verse 33. It talks about again about the snare. Exodus chapter 34 verse number 12. Again, it talks about the snare. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 25. It talks about the images that the people of, of Israel had made other than God and which ensnared them. In Joshua chapter 23 verse, verses 13, it also talks about, you know, how the, 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 the Lord had told the people of Israel to drive out all those nations. But Joshua and other and the people of Israel did not drive out those nations. And as a result, they made an alliance with those people and they got ensnared by going into that particular relationship. And as a result, they were completely destroyed. You know, my brothers and sisters, I want to take you to a New Testament scripture, which is also talking about a, a snare. It's only it's also talking about a trap, which every one of us at some stage of our life have fallen into. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9. Let's talk in detail about this snare which is applicable to every single person. And let's go in detail and see how we should be able to get out of this trap. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse number 9. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You know, my brothers and sisters, when people have money, you know, when people have money, a lot of money, they do not experience the problems that poor people have. You know, poor people, when they, when they don't have money, they have to depend, you know, how they are going to get their bread, how they are going to eat their breakfast, how they are going to eat their lunch, where will the money come to have dinner? They don't, don't even know about the next day. They don't even sometimes know how they are going to feed themselves on the same day. So the people who have money, a lot of money, do not experience the problems that rich people have. And as Jesus thought, the lust to do something is just as bad as the act himself, uh, itself. You know, the, the desire, the lust that we have within us is so bad within us than the very thing that we want to do. For example, he said in Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 28, he says, it is not the sexual act that is, that is, that is sinful. It is the desire when you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, that's the time you are committing adultery in your heart. And you know, my brothers and sisters, many poor people, listen to this, many poor people are guilty of the same things. They desire to do if only they had money. You know, many poor people, they look at rich people and they say, if only we had money, we could have had a big house. If only we had money, we could have had a, a, have a beautiful car. If only we had money, we could have eaten in, in McDonald's. If only we had money, we could have eaten in a, in a five-star restaurant. So even the people who are poor, they also are guilty of the same desires that only money can bring. And the solution, brothers and sisters, isn't staying poor. Let me say this. Because even poor people are going to have those desires when they look at rich people. So staying poor isn't, 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 isn't the solution. It is dealing with the lust in the heart. Please understand my brothers and sisters. We, we started that a few days ago. That the lust that is there. Those desires that are put within us. Are the problem of all evil. And you know my brothers and sisters. As this verse that we saw in the book to uh, St. Paul's to Timothy. Money also presents opportunities that poor people don't have. 
Money also presents opportunities that poor people don't have. It's the love of money, my brothers and sisters, which is the root of all evil. That's what St. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. Money is not the problem. Money is not, the, not, not evil. But it is the love of money which is the problem. And money is just a tool. Money is just a tool of the devil to take us away. And when we begin to love money, that's the time all the problems are going to come. You know, my brothers and sisters, money by itself is neither good or bad. Please understand, money by itself is neither good or bad, but money can be an asset in the hands of people with the right attitude, with the right heart condition. Because many times people who have never accepted the Lord, they have never ever experienced that love of God. They have never been born again. When they have money in their hands, they really don't need, uh, they don't have a desire for their conversion. They don't have a desire to have a relationship with Lord. Because their money is their sources. It is the money that is going to feed their stomachs. And they were brothers and sisters. Money by itself is neither bad or good. But money can be a great asset in the hands of people with the right attitude, with the right heart condition. And you know my brothers and sisters, there are many temptations. Listen to this. There are many temptations which come to those who have a lot of wealth, who have got a lot of money. Suddenly, one of the subtlest, very subtle it is, and most damaging is the temptation to minimize their need for God. You know, my brothers and sisters, I do not know whether you are experiencing this right now, if you have a lot of money in your bank, and even though you go to church, even though you are seeking the Lord, there is some place in your mind, somewhere down the line, where the thought is, even if I don't go to church, even if I don't read my Bible, even if I don't seek the Lord, I'm still going to have all my meals. I'm still going to have a nice bed to sleep. I'm still going to have a good car to drive. I'm still got everything which is going to be provided because I've got enough money in order for me to live my life. So at this very moment, there is no danger for me. But brothers and sisters, wealthy people are often deceived by the power that their money has. Please understand. Wealthy people have been deceived by the power that their money has. They think that they can do anything on their own and they don't need God for sure. That is the reason why people do not have uh, that desire to have intimacy with God. They don't have that desire to spend time with God. They don't have that desire to really, you know, invest time. Because anyway, I've got all my needs. God can also have about 10, 15 minutes. Maybe you can have half an hour. Maybe you can have an hour or two. No problem. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when we go to the Old Testament, for example, you look at all the heroes in the Old Testament, like Abraham, like David. You know, these people certainly were very wealthy people in the Bible, but they never ever had any of those desires about money. Abraham was the very rich man. David was a very rich man. But they were never deceived because they knew who their source was. They had a relationship with the Lord. And you know, my brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to happen to people today that if, if Abraham and David could have a relationship in spite of being so wealthy, you and I, even though we may have wealth, we may have a house, we may have a bank balance, we may have a good house to stay, we may even have a good job that is giving us money. It certainly can never happen to just like what is happening to the people of the world. If David and Abraham showed us through their relationship with God that even though they were wealthy, they did not have to go according to the ways of the world. And you know, my brothers and sisters, there is without a doubt one of the greatest drawbacks of wealth that every believer should be on guard against. Every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ should be alert, should be on guard. Why? Because money can slowly, subtly can take us away from the Lord. And we can even think, we may be deceived that we are coming to the Lord, we are going to Bible class, we are serving in the church, we are doing all these good things. But in the heart of hearts, it is always we can fall back on our money. We can fall back on our wealth. We know that there is a meal to eat. There is a place for us to have a, to go for fine dining. We can have a good house to stay. We can drive the posh cars. And you know, when that happens, you can always fall back 
there's a tendency to be deceived that everything is fine. We are very well ready to receive the Lord when he comes again. And this can be one of the greatest deception of the devil to keep us all engaged, to keep us all distracted so that when the Lord actually comes again, we find ourselves absolutely deceived. We will never be able to receive him because we will be fearful every single moment when we begin to see calamities happening around, pandemics happening around, you know, people, people dying of sickness around. We can hear about, you know, so many negative things happening in the world around. There will never be that confidence of knowing that, you know, Christ is going to return and that we can live with him for all eternity because we have never ever put our trust in him. We have never ever allowed God to be God in our life. And you know, my brothers and sisters, that is the greatest deception that is, that is there for many Christians today because they always think just by going to church, just by going for their obligation mass on a Sunday, by doing their family prayer, reading a little bit of Bible, going to a retreat, going for a Bible study, they are all fine with whatever they are doing. But truly speaking, the love of money is exactly what is keeping them away from really going into intimacy, that relationship between two lovers, that, 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 that intercourse, that, that oneness which is there between a husband and a wife. That relationship can only take place when we put our complete trust in this God who wants the very best for his children. You know, brothers and sisters, in, in, in this analogy, in this particular verse, the love of money is the bait that Satan uses to trap us. Please understand, Satan uses the love of money as, as a trap, as a bait to trap us and to destroy our lives. Money in itself is not bad, as I told you earlier. We all have to have some of it to live. If, if, if many of you think, okay, from today, I'm just going to donate all my money and I'm just going to live like a sannyasi or I'm going to live like a hermit. Please don't do that. That's not what it says. It is only when we begin to love the power that money can give us that we enter into the snare of the devil. We can have money as long as it is. it doesn't have us. Let me say this. Oh, beautiful. We can have as much as money as we have, no problem, but money should never have us, my brothers and sisters. You know, in this particular verse, in, in, in the book of Timothy, it's, it, isn't it interesting that Paul has used the example of someone drowning to describe what money does to us? What a, what a wonderful example the Holy Spirit gave St. Paul. He's saying, he's giving the example of money as someone who's drowning in, as far as money is concerned. You know, my brothers and sisters, we all of us, all of us, including you and me, we know that we cannot live without water. It is a necessity of life. Yet, we have to use it in, in a proper way. We can drink it, but we can't breathe with it. Is that right? We can never breathe with water. We must drink water. If it gets into our lungs in sufficient quantities, what will happen to us? This water, which is good for drinking, can actually drown us and can suffocate us and prevent us from, from, from breathing and we shall choke and we shall die. That's exactly what happens to somebody who, who falls into, a, into the sea or falls into a, a swimming pool who doesn't know to drown. The water gets into their lungs and, the, and they are not able to breathe and they, and, and they will drown and they will die. In the same way, brothers and sisters, money is a necessity. We can't live without it, but using it wrongly will kill us. That's exactly what the word of God says. Just like drowning doesn't happen instantly, it takes time for the love of money to kill us. Please understand that. Drowning that will not initially kill you instantly. There is a process by which the water should go into your mouth, get into your lungs, you should stop being able to breathe, and that's the time you are, you are choked and you will die. In the same way, brothers, the love of money is something that grows and grows over a period of time until just like that water getting into our lungs and not allowing us to breathe. In the same way, the love of money comes as a slow little poison into us and kills us. At the, at, at the first sign of the love of money, my brothers and sisters, listen to this. At the first sign when you begin to love money, you must understand we should stop what started it and grasp for the fresh air of the Holy Spirit. Just as a drowning person wants to grasp for fresh air. Please understand my brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is teaching us something about snare today. We have to understand if there is something that is going to give us a trap. For example, if you're all the time being attracted to watch the television, you're wanting to watch soap operas, 
that there are some people who get so addicted to watching some you know pornography they get they just want to watch a little bit which is there in those movies and as a result that slow movement gets you to watch pornography slow movement for example a drunkard he just sees i want to take a couple of sips of alcohol that one sip becomes one peg and one peg becomes five pegs the moment you begin to sense that something is going to trap you something that you are really getting attracted to it's time for us to initially get to the world take a fresh air of the holy spirit and allow that fresh air to come of the spirit and help us to prevent from being drowned you know my brothers and sisters the devil is crafty the devil is wicked the devil hates god and hates the people of god and when we begin to follow the instructions of the word of god when we follow the leading of the holy spirit we will definitely not allow the devil to kill us and destroy us you know my brothers and sisters any of us who are so afraid of drowning that we won't want water that that we won't drink water are also fools if you are afraid of drowning will you not drink water surely you will drink water if you don't drink water we will die likewise my brothers and sisters any of us who are so afraid of the problems that the love of money produces that we won't want to have any uh, any of the you know any of it are also fools please understand just because you don't want to you know get into the trap so you live like a sanyasi you live a very simple life it's not that God has given us wealth he wants his children to be prosperous but he doesn't want prosperity to have us he doesn't want that money to have us we will die without uh, water if we do not um, drink water and we will die without without uh, money and without food if we do not have it and we will never be able to be bless anyone without our money please understand God has blessed us with wealth God has blessed us with money so that we in turn can be a blessing to others we cannot avoid money we need to learn to make money our slave instead of allowing money to become uh, to become slaves of money please understand my brothers and sisters when we begin to understand what jesus is talking into us in verse number 35 about being slaves being ensnared whenever you sense something is making you a slave some particular habit is making you a slave go back to the root of the problem go back to that very source which is making you a slave Chop it up from your life. If the television is something that is giving you much fear, the news of the world, the statistics of, of COVID nineteen, if those things are, are are coming into your life, into your mind, it's time for you to you know cut off the plug of the television, stop that television set, and allow the good news to sink into your heart. Allow your mind to be renewed so that you can be prepared for the Lord's second coming. And brothers and sisters, just like money, or just like water, or just like any other source. we must be on the lookout we must be watchful so that we never get ensnared by the devil who is so crafty that he is so subtle in his temptation but when we are connected to the word of god when we begin to study the word of god the holy spirit will be faithful and will give us that understanding and take us out of that trap and set us free just as jesus set us free on the cross so that not only will be saved for all eternity but on this very earth we will able to live an abundant life we'll be able to live a prosperous life we'll able to live a life in divine health and every good thing of the kingdom of god verse number 36 be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the son of man you know my brothers and sisters jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want us to be lost he doesn't want us to be ensnared by the devil he wants us to be alert he wants us to be praying he wants us to be standing like guards who are always waiting and listening to his instruction why because he says when all these things are going to happen before his second coming we should have the strength to escape all these things how are we going to escape all these things brothers and sisters whatever is going to happen on this earth will happen because god's word is true there will be pandemics there will be earthquakes there will be there will be financial uh, uh, you know storms there will be wars going around there will be volcanoes there will be hurricanes there will be storms but even in the midst of all that is happening around us when we know that we have god's presence with us when we know that the spirit of god is directing our life we will never be weak we will have the strength to face all those things and in turn we will be ready to receive the lord jesus christ you know my brothers and sisters 
we can all of us we can escape all the judgment that will take place by the world uh, which <laughs> take place to the world by in surprise if we watch and pray because there is going to be a day of judgment jesus is going to come to the earth that is for sure there is going to be a second coming but you and i can escape that judgment and what is going to happen to the world if we are alert and we are praying and watchful you know brothers and sisters this is simply telling us that we need to be in fellowship with the lord and look for the signs of his second coming yeah, unless we are going to have fellowship with the holy spirit we are connected to the word of god we are spending time being sensitive to what the holy spirit is telling us we will never ever be able to see the signs of his second coming we we'll always depend on somebody to give us the prophet prophetic word we we'll always depend on somebody else to tell us what is happening on this earth we don't need that when we have when we are sons and daughters of the heavenly father the spirit of god lives inside of us this spirit of god is more than willing to direct our lives to that purpose to that mission to that goal that he has put each one of us on this planet earth. and you know my brothers and sisters that jesus is coming is for sure and we must be prepared to receive him we must be ready to welcome him and when he comes there then we are ready he will only hear these words and we need to practice it every day we need to say this every day because we need to rehearse what we want jesus to say to us well done good and faithful servant welcome into your master's joy welcome into your master's kingdom for all eternity amen let us pray father in heaven we thank you and we praise you for giving us the understanding of your word for helping us to understand how and why we need to be alert why we need to be in tune with the holy spirit why we need to be in in that intimacy with you and your word lord because we know we are in the times of your coming we know that we are in the times where our salvation is near and as we begin each day to plant the word of god in our heart as we begin to become sensitive to your word and the holy spirit we know and we know that lord you are faithful to your word you are faithful to your promise that you are giving us direction in the midst of all that is happening around us you are still allowing us to move to the finishing line so that when we meet you and we greet you at your second coming we will only hear those beautiful words well done good and faithful servant welcome and live in your master's joy for all this lord for the great promise that you have given us and for the hope that we one day will live with you as one in the in your kingdom we thank you and we praise you father in the glorious name of jesus amen